dial it in, he goes down the aisle, and then the store's got him because they know that Jeremy loves salty snacks. And, he, and again, here comes a Lay's coupon, and he buys three Lay's and he gets one free. But the store's now getting smarter and smarter. They know this will make Jeremy thirsty, and he's British, so he must love beer. And they're going to try to Americanize him since he didn't know what the football stadium looked like. And they pushed an American beer to him, Budweiser. But Jeremy, true to his roots, picked up one, one, one little case there of Belgium beer, Stella. So there you go. A whole different experience. And if you think this is tomorrow's science fiction, join Jeremy in Area 51 this week, and we'll show you this is not science fiction. And indeed, this is retailing and advertising of the future. And by the way, the store figured if Jeremy drank all beer, he might need something else too. So at any rate, that, a little bit corny. I apologize for that. I usually don't do corny things, but what the heck. But the, um, the, the concept you got, how you blend your structured data, your unstructured data with public sources and sources of your partners to, and do it in real time to change the entire business experience. And this will change every industry I have on this page, I am sure, over the next five years. Tremendous opportunity. Now, this big data and all this mass amount of information is a place to live. That's called storage. Uh, we have a big position in storage, as you, might, as you might all know. But let me give you a couple of concepts and words on storage that we deeply believe. And you'll hear more from Pat Gelsinger. He'll drive down a lot deeper than this. You could take a string of bytes, right? And you could store them on any of these kinds of media. I could store them on SATA drives that are now in the three going to four gigabytes per three and a half inch form factor or, or fat SAS. I could store them on high speed fiber channel or SAS drives. More performance, a little more cost. I could put them on flash drives, all solid state devices. There's really two kinds of solid state devices. There's MLC technology, multi-level cell, single level cell, a little bit difference in performance and reliability. And then, again, I could put it in memory, in, in DRAM, in, 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 in memory. So the more I move to the right, the better my cost per IOPS is going to be. The more I go to the left, the lower my cost to store a certain amount of bytes is going to be. So which is the right place to store this information I talked about? The answer is, it depends. They're all the right place. It depends. How, what's the longevity of the information? What's the usage of the information? What other applications is, the inform is that information dealing with? How fast, is, how fast do you need that data to arrive at your user? All of that depends. What you want to do is minimize the cost with the maximum experience. So all forms of media are right. The second thing that's important is where do you actually put that media? I can take a PCIe card, flash card, and put it in the server. I could, I could take a series of flash devices, flash cards, and put them in the server network. I could, take, I could build a storage array in the, in the storage network of all flash, and of course, the majority of which all storage will be is hybrid arrays, where, I'll have an, where we'll build an array of, of partially flash and, and partially drives. And of course, these are our product family as we go, as you'll hear more deeply from Pat. BF Cache, Project Thunder. Project means we didn't quite announce it yet. VMAX, VNX, VNXE, Isilon, and Project X. They asked me not to talk about Project X, so I won't say a word about Extreme IO. <laughs> nice being CEO, you can do what you want. <laughs> to a point. The real critical part here is the automation software. We call it fast. How do, how do you set what service levels you need, performance levels you need, what cost metrics you need to hit, what policies you need to need adhere to? You set them, and then we will move the data automatically, very safely, very securely. And this is the future of storage. So the bottom line, anybody that tells you one size fits all is way off base. One size does not fit all. 
if there is one thing that is either going to accelerate the benefits of big data and cloud computing or slow down those benefits, significantly slow down those benefits, is our ability as an industry to demonstrate trust and security in the big data assets and the cloud. Fundamentally, that is what's going to gate, in my opinion, it's one man's opinion, but in my opinion, this is what, these, this factor here is what will gate how fast the benefits of big data, predictive analytics, cloud computing will come to, come to businesses and governments, and us as individuals. In the old world, things were much more static. And the way we did is we kind of protected our, 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 our computers, if you will, our systems with moats. And you had to cross these moats for firewalls. You had to cross these moats with antivirus. And if you think of how this industry was built, go back to my example into the mainframe. When you had a proprietary terminal, 3270, you had a proprietary network, you didn't really have to worry too much about antivirus. You didn't have to worry too much about protecting your firewall because everything was contained and proprietary. When you move to you know, IP networking, when you move to almost any device you could think of as an end user device, the whole game changes. And the way, the way the industry solved those problems that came up as we substituted a PC for a terminal was they funded, say, the antivirus industry and new companies were born. And both that technology was bolted on. Again, same thing happened when we substituted proprietary networking topologies for IP. They built firewall companies, for instance, and they were bolted on. In the cloud world, we got a chance to clean this up a bit and build in some of these defenses. And it's a very dynamic world. And because of the benefits, if you will, of social networking and a bit about big data and the speed of, these, of, of, of computing, makes security harder because what they're doing now is they're phishing and they're actually stealing somebody in your company or one of your partner's identities so that when they come in some of those other security bolt-on security software is irrelevant because they're coming in as a real real certified person the credentials of that person are perfect they've been stolen therefore what we have to do is get into the system now and look for behavior and we got to map behavior of every user and we've got to look for anomalies in real time. This is a big data problem. So in real time, we'll look at things that say Pat does when he gets in and, and we'll say, well, Pat has perfect ability and rights to look at that data. I've never seen Pat look at it from I I Iran before. Maybe we should stop it. I've never seen Pat send that data to Google before or Amazon Web Services before. Maybe we should stop it and they should, they will stop it. So that's kind of the, how the world is changing. And you'll hear a lot more about this at this concept. But it's, we've got to change from, kind of, from the old world security to a much more dynamic security. Because if we do this right, there's going to be tremendous opportunity and acceleration of the cloud. So let me close out a bit here by talking to you a little bit about our family tree, what we're trying to do inside the EMC, the broad EMC, the consolidated EMC's family. Obviously, we talked about it. We have we, using all that kind of media in all those places, right? In the, in the server, in the server network, in the storage network. Huge arrays, not a one size fits all, a huge selection of different storage products, best of breed. Once that information is stored, we want to make sure it's protected, always available. And of course, we want to, protect, we want to secure that information itself, either at rest or in flight. Then, of course, in VMware, they're building a cloud operating system. And what they have the ability to do and what they've been doing is they take existing applications, they can encapsulate them and make them run in this flexible virtual cloud environment very reliably with a lot more agility and a lot more cost benefit. They work even more intimately with the framework world when you use a Spring or a Rails or a Nodes benefits. Again, Big, the big killer app here is going to be how do we build new analytical, predictive analytical applications to give you this massive business benefit. And again, we're going to, there's, we're, there's ways we're doing that. One of the latest things we did, which, you'll, which we'll talk to you about, is our acquisition of Pivotal Labs uh, in our own uh, 
IIG group. We're, we're doing a lot there to rewrite our applications more flexibly, more SaaS-like. And of course, we're working with many, many other vendors in this new world because this is going to be what defines the killer app, what defines this new cloud generation. And of course, we have to look, work with this proliferation of choice of devices that your, your, your employees, your users will demand. There's no longer we can say, buy a new PC of this make every three years, here it is. This is a world of choice. So what we have to do now is provision the end user themselves for a set of rights, a set of capabilities, and give them the ability to have choice while still having superb security of identities and the information that's transmitted over to, that, to those devices. And of course, while we're doing all this, we have to make sure we're adhering to good governance risk and compliance metrics. That's what we do in our family. That's what you'll be hearing a lot about from us and our partners at this conference. So what can you expect from EMC? What should you expect from EMC? For us to give you distinctive products, not good enough, not good, but distinctive products. You can expect us to do that by continuing to invest over 11% on organic R&D and build a very talented cadre of engineers which are here to host you. Many of, many of our engineers, thousands of our engineers, a couple thousand of our engineers are here. Okay, we're back live inside the Cube here at EMC World 2012. We're watching Joe Tucci's keynote um, happening right now on the hall, kicking off this big event. Pat Gelsinger will be joining right after. And this is where EMC lays out their agenda for the next year. Big conference 2012, EMC World. We are we're going to be hearing about Tucci's uh, commentary. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and I'm joined with my co-host Dave Vellante, founder of Wikibon.org, and Peter Chang, the CEO of Oxygen Cloud. Um, Peter, welcome to theCUBE, back to theCUBE. You. you were on at Node Summit uh, when we covered uh, Node.js, one of the developers. Um, Joe Tucci's keynote obviously talks about uh, the debate on public-private cloud. He thinks that's silly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a comment uh, he made. Uh, Dave, what, what do you think about that comment? And let's talk about some of the dynamics around cloud, because we've been having a big debate about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and really two debates happening within that world. Not so much public-private cloud, Dave, but really that it will be both, so we agree with Tucci un, un, unequivocally. However, the debate is, is that infrastructure as a service and platform as a service a race to zero? like in a hosting model, or as some people are saying, including us, that software and other technologies will wrap around cloud for differentiation. So Dave, what, what are your yeah, I mean, I think that that? I think Tucci's, I agree with him in the sense that yes, of course everybody's going to be doing a little bit of all of the above, but the reality is that organizations have a predominant cloud strategy that is either public, predominantly public, you know, like small companies like us, John, right? Our strategy would be characterized as predominantly public cloud. We don't want to build our own infrastructure. There are other companies that Whose, whose infrastructure is predominantly private cloud, and there are others, increasingly as, as the Wikibon data that we've been talking about shows, that are increasingly moving toward a hybrid cloud. And so, I think that, um, yes, while everybody's going to be doing a little bit of everything, there are predominant strategies that are a function of your skill sets, where you are as a company, your maturity levels, how much legacy baggage you have, and, um, and I think that... Um, Joe Tucci's stepping down right now off the keynote, stage is going dark, and, uh, you know, they've got the space theme here, Dave, you know? Store Trek, they have uh, you know, all kinds of space outfits. I wasn't going to say that EMC executives are space cadets, because that would be kind of uh, raining on their whole space theme, but um, these guys are absolutely aggressively with marketing, their messaging, cloud means big data. Peter, what do you see in the cloud market? As we wait for Pat Gelsinger to come on. What is your take on cloud right now? Obviously, public, private cloud, I don't think there's really any debate that they're both going to coexist. But you have IT enterprises, that are re-architecting their data centers, mm -hmm. and you have the whole service provider market. So what's your angle on all that? Yeah, I think the, the question of public versus private is sort of misses the point. You know, the cloud is really a style of computing, it's not a place. This is not a question about where do I host and run my infrastructure, right? Public or private. It's about how you approach the question of how do you, uh, how do you uh, provide computing. Uh, in this modern uh, era. So we think that obviously they're going to blend uh, together um, from a hosting aspect, but what Oxygen is doing is uh, I think playing the next role, which is looking at how cloud is really more of an infrastructure or a middleware uh, that ties everything together. So this is how applications can be built, this is how data can be provisioned, how compute can be accessed. If we think about it more as middleware, the way it, that to roll out uh, sort of solutions to come together much faster and much more fluidly. What do you think about the EMC messaging in terms of how they position their company? 
as a uh, as a big data cloud yeah. company. Yeah, provider and these services, critical service. I was they got VMware, they own VMware. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, at, at first blush, when you think EMC and, and cloud, it's sort of like, hmm, well, that's that's kind of strange. Uh, this is all about uh, stuff that's deployed within the enterprise uh, environment. But um, as you think about it some more, and as cloud is evolving, it makes perfect sense, right? That cloud is not just about storage that might be running or computer that might be running out, you know, some data center. It's IT uh, is going to be doing all of these services themselves. So it makes sense that IT will be taking a lot of the cloud approach in-house with data and with compute. We're going to, we might go uh, switch back to Pat Gelsinger when he comes on, but while we're waiting for Pat Gelsinger, Joe Tucci talked about waves of changes and that technology is really enabling that. Um, what, from your perspective, you're out there, what is your quick take on that? Yeah, waves of change. Uh, this is where, uh, you know, I'll, let me just highlight one big wave of change, which is the iPad adoption, right? The mobile, uh, the mobile uh, adoption is really sort of reshaping a lot of... Uh, Hold on, Mark, angles. let's go to Pat Gelsinger right now. Captain Kirk sitting in the chair, Star Trek. I wanted to do that ever <laughs> since I was a kid, right? You know, being Captain Kirk. It is a pleasure to be with you today at EMC World. Welcome to Star Trek 2012. As we think about science fiction, and you'll see the science fiction theme this week as we go along. Science fiction is always playing on the edge of science and physics and reality and trying to just explore the limits right, of our understanding. And as we're looking at this and preparing for today, we thought, is there a physics of information technology? Can we go take some of those physical properties and look at IT technology through that lens? You know, physical properties like gravity. One of the most important aspects of interplanetary travel is gravity and the effects of gravity, right? And this idea of bodies having mass and attracting others to them. And when we think about gravity in the data center or IT sense, applications have been that center of gravity for the last several decades, right? Where their mass and their viscosity has dictated them at the center of things and data needs to be brought to them. And if we look inside of this vertical industry, the app was the center, and it was bound irrevocably to a specific set of hardware. And that hardware locked up a set of data services that were part of it. And it created this gravity center around the application framework. Virtualization and cloud computing has changed all of that. It's fundamentally broken that fundamental linkage of apps, infrastructure, and data and allowed them to move around fairly fluidly. In fact, we can, for the first time, sort of pick up those apps and move them to modern new infrastructure. It's changed and fundamentally reduced the viscosity of applications in this world. And if we think about the implications of that, right, it has fundamentally reduced the mass and viscosity of that environment and created a very agile environment for applications where service catalogs allow us to sort of put different policies in place right, and move them around in fairly flexible and powerful ways, re reducing both the viscosity and the mass of that data. And fundamentally, right, we are partnering with customers and our industry players to create such a flexibility. And in uh, November of last year at Europe Sapphire, we announced right, an example of this with SAP, VMware, and EMC coming together to reduce the mass and viscosity of SAP's application set and make it much easier to deploy and create those infrastructure. And you know, we announced it, and we'd like to give a demonstration of some of the progress that we've made right, against that flexibility and agility of that environment. And to join me, none other than virtual geek Chad Sackick. Pat, it is great to be here, man. You know, last time I demoed with Chad, right, he didn't have a riser, so you couldn't even see him behind <laughs> the thing. So this is pretty cool. You've grown a little bit, Chad. This the, is great. The genes, they giveth <laughs> and they taketh away. Okay, right? okay. So what have we got here, Chad? Uh, so we thought it would be great to demonstrate this idea. This is SAP LVM, Landscape Virtualization Manager. Okay, and this is how, and if you were an SAP geek, this is what you would be living in. The right way to think of it is this is the Unisphere for SAP. All right, okay. okay. Simple, easy, and how they manage their application. What we're going to do here is a common task, which is cloning an entire landscape environment. Okay. But we're going to make it a lot easier by integrating the infrastructure with the app. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we've got this landscape. Today. Uh, 